Holland, armored divisional signals carry on the off-DCS tradition, the message must get through. A forward tank commander finds his wireless sender has ceased to function. He immediately dispatches a message for a replacement from a nearby tank back to advanced brigade headquarters. At advanced brigade, the message is received and taken to the signals office, where it is registered for retransmission to the address sheet. The signal master has several alternative methods of passing the message. Traffic is divided equally among the various systems to speed transmission. Fuller phone is used to flash it on its way. When other methods fail, the dispatch rider gets through. So the message finally reaches its destination, technical maintenance section of signal spot. Here an instrument mechanic loads a new wireless set into his mobile service shop. It is rushed forward to replace the dud set in the tank. Through the work of Royal Canadian Signals, the complex organization of a great army is closely knitted together. Living up to the traditions of their patron saint, Hermes, the winged messenger, signals are the fighting example of the motto on their core crest. Well up, we're through this vigilance. Speed, accuracy, watchfulness. Major General Spy, on an inspection tour of his command, visits a field artillery regiment in Holland. An informal checkup is given to one of the many units that make up the terrific concentration of firepower which drove the enemy back from the beaches of Normandy to his own border. In the wet, muddy gun position, gunners must work overtime to keep their pieces in good condition. General Fry finds nothing wrong with the maintenance. There's no time for a regular inspection parade, so the commander has an informal talk with his men. Questions are answered and complaints heard. Jerry will hear more from Canadian guns when the advance again gets underway. In Antwerp Harbor is found the answer to the German claim of having blown up the main lock by means of underwater troops. In a steady stream, the great supply ships steam up the Scheldt into the harbor. They are loaded to the gunnels with motor transport, tanks, and vehicle stores. Longshoremen labor day and night at one of the world's greatest ports. They keep the supplies moving up to the armies on the western front. The front door to our supply route is indeed wide open. On the Wall River west of my maiden, the Royal Canadian Signals call on the engineers to aid them in a cyclic job. To maintain communications, a submarine cable is laid across the river. With a fast current flowing and only a converted barge from which to operate, the procedure calls for great skill. Paying out the heavy cable from the improvised cable layer, the job is completed on the first try. The cable will be used by signals as a trunk route to carry a large volume of telephone and telegraph traffic between two high formations. The army jeep has finally become streamlined. No more will the cold winds of winter freeze the luckless rider in the fresh air taxi. Something new has been added. A plastiglass superstructure guaranteed to make the jeep as comfortable as a town car. All we need now is soft cushions and we'll have a real jalopy to drive after the war. A German-type flamethrower captured from the enemy receives a workout in Holland. Deadly indeed are the fiery weapons of war. Used by the Germans in the Blitzkrieg of 1940, they were adopted by the Allied armies with devastating results in our Blitzkrieg of 1944. Canadian designed flame discharges proved their work in the drive through Holland. In the offense, covered by smoke, flame throwing carriers burn the enemy from his strong point. Sherlock twins from Simcoe, Ontario, like Lieutenants Allen and Eric, are the cause of many headaches at RCAF Bomber Command. 
they just can't be pulled apart. Both holding the DFG and both having completed their second tour of bombing operations in Halifaxes, they have operated as a team since childhood. Starting in business life in the grocery trade, one wholesaling, one retailing, they both joined the infantry and together transferred to the Air Force. First class pilots, they are popular with their messmates of the Lion Squadron. <laughs> Canadian Wren joins her sisters in the WRNS as a member of a Royal Navy crew. At a South Coast port, the girls man their own craft. Many of the little ships have been taken over by girls. Their job is to ferry personnel from the seaside to the ships that anchor it. A popular lot with their passengers, the seagoing lasses handle their jobs like old stock. consider themselves the luckiest girls in the service. A happy life on the ocean waves brings color to cheeks which need no powder nor lube. Coco Molly of Montreal is the only Canadian attached to a British boat crew, a role for the life of a sailor. In Italy, it's holiday time for the boys of a Canadian artillery unit. The first event is known as the Skunk Hollow Handicap. The fair mutuals do a land office business as the bang tails parade to the post. The odds-on favorite is Kirby out of trouble. It's post time and the track is fast. The only problem is getting the blue blood to mule them to the starting line. The track master does have his trouble. It's a snappy six furlongs and the favorite is the winner. A turkey shoot is another feature of the day. All the spectators are invited to enter the contest. The infantrymen think they have the edge, but the boys of artillery and signals give them a good run for their money. After winning the prize, he's off to catch it, and that's some job. To the victors go the spoils. There are going to be some happy faces around the certain cookhouse tonight. Sing of the ballet gap. The grim threat of war is on the throne and reigns supreme. One year later, time and nature have changed the appearance of Lasker's battlefield. A country of peace goes about. Out of yesterday's ruins rise the homes of tomorrow. Sims of man. Mother Nature has added her pigments to the pastoral picture. Over the Kapitei airfield, she has spread a magic carpet of flowers. Against its gay background stand the harsh reminders of a war which passed this way in all its fury. still rumbles is now ready for the reason. To the present, occupation, liberation, and all things fashioned by the hand of ambitious men are secondary to the task of wresting food from the land. But plucking golden grain from smiling fields, Frenchmen remember the sacrifice which brought them peace. At their quiet task, they plagued anew, liberating friends who passed on freedom's hope one year ago today. Ontario capital, the Toronto Mermaid Swimming Club have the perfect antidote for war nerves. After a long shift to the aircraft factory or in the office, what could be better than a nice long swim? One balances the other, and the result is more planes for the war against Japan.
least that's what the experts say. When the girls get together in the swimming pool, there is no time to talk scandal, so they put their energy into some messy routines. It takes many nights away from the old knitting circle to gain the skill needed to float a perfect formation. Judging by the snappy results, boyfriends will be buying his socks from the QM stores for the duration. What? No time for scandal? Well, just a little. Rosie the Riveter and Swing Ship Dolly keep a weather eye open as their sister mermaids go into a difficult number. You can never tell when a Hollywood talent scout is apt to drop into a hot house pool. If the Navy runs into any mermaids at sea, like the Queen City variety, there'll be many a foot slogger want to transfer to the senior service, but quickly. of the Toronto Mermaids Club are attracting a great deal of attention by their excellent form. Composed of several champions who hold many Canadian records, they have a brilliant future. Coached by their president, Mr. Angus Erskine, they are already a bright star in the swimming world. In Denmark's capital, Copenhagen, 200,000 people witness a great exhibition of air power staged by RAF and RCAF flyers. It is Northern Europe's greatest demonstration of flying since the Thousand Bomber Ray. Queen Alexandrina of Denmark attends the show, which is a native resident who were injured in the March raids against Gestapo headquarters. Jet propelled over the greatest of fields with all that's known to their veteran pilots. Spitfires add their stunts to the great display of aerial battle. Once the terror of the Luftwaffe, they now play games to thrill their Danish friends. Mosquitoes, tempests, and rocket-firing cities also do their stuff. Queen Alexandrina thanks the promoter of the show, Group Captain Johnny Johnson, CEO of the top-scoring Canadian Spitfire Wing, while dive bombers demonstrate their ability to hit the bullseye. The proceeds of the exhibition amount to over $98,000. They are distributed by a committee of Danish resistance leaders to their bombed-out countrymen. So Canadian and British skymen forge new bonds of friendship in liberated Denmark. In Valdeo, Quebec, surplus clothing of Canada's armed forces is sorted at the repair depot. It is to be sent to the liberated countries of Europe as a gift of the Dominion. Sorters work overtime to tag each garment, noting the repairs to be made by dozens of seamstresses. In the boot mending shop, thousands of boots and shoes of all kinds are put into operational condition by the cobbler. With boots in Europe drastically ripened, the gifts from Canada will be a godsend to two of people. As good as new, they are packed for shipment abroad. Organized by the Canadian Army, the steam is handed over to civilian control. The distribution is carried out through UNRWA and the Red Cross. Consigned to liberated countries and Russia, the clothing and shoes will materially aid their people on the road to recovery. of a great struggle are tasted as a live might is lined up for a grand victory parade. From the reviewing stand, leaders of the United Nations gaze with pride on the men who made success a reality. The fight band of the Argyle and Sutherland Highlanders leads the Canadian Berlin Battalion in the March Pass. Picked from units of D-Day and the Italian campaign, the composite Canadian group represents their comrades of the 1st Canadian Army. They join their mates of the British Army in a display of military power which cracks the chances of the crooked cross. In the dark weeks of 1940, when the Empire fought with her back to the wall, the day of ultimate victory existed only in dreams. Today, through years of blood, sweat and tears, 
the British Commonwealth joins her allies in the consummation of those dreams. the call of the mother country. Canadians stood by on the beaches of England to help repel expected invasion. When it didn't come, they claimed two years for the chance to attack. The day their job well done, proudly they take their place among the empire's mighty, which stood the test and have won the right to celebrate a glorious victory. <laughs>